to roll. Here we go. Right on. Hey everyone and welcome to the adventure from the Sedgwick County Zoo where we're talking about positive impacts on climate change. And Clint, you've got Shanae and Kristen with you today. Yeah, hey. Hey, we're out here out at Sedgwick County Zoo talking to Shanae about weather and climate change. I'm gonna turn it over to her. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. Well, you know, a question that we often get asked about is, is climate change and what is it? And if you're like me, you've had someone somewhere when we've had strange weather go, oh, so much for climate change. So let's just talk a little bit about what climate change is and how it is affecting animals. Now we have to take a step way back first though and talk about what is weather. Weather is what we have today. And if you're in Wichita, when you got up this morning, it was pouring down rain and lightning. So weather is those, those activities that are daily, weekly, but they're short. Rainstorms, thunderstorms, snowstorms, they're not long-term. Climate, however, is the long-term scenario. So even though today was rainy here in Wichita, Wichita's climate isn't rainy. Um, it just happened to be today is rainy. So you might say Wichita's climate is humid in the summer and cold in the winter. That would be more of our climate. So then once you know those, there's another term you've probably heard. We've already said it just once, and that's global warming. This gets a lot of people confused because if all of a sudden we have a free cold snow snap in May, everybody thinks, well, then global warming can't be happening because it's warm. Global warming is the long-term heating of our planet. It's not a daily thing. It's not a weekly thing. It's looking at those long-term changes. So when we look at global warming, we're not talking about a, a one-off event. We're looking at data throughout history to see how it compares with where we are now where climate change is the long-term change in our climate patterns. So for example, if you've grown up here in Wichita, I've been here now 20 years. When I first moved here, we had more snow. A lot of people will say if they grew up in Wichita as a kid, they had snow. Um, where this last, say, five to 10 years, we haven't had as much snow. That is a long-term pattern. So when we look at climate change, we're looking at those long-term patterns. We're not looking at how last year was versus this year. We're looking at how it changes over time. So global warming is in truth just simply part of the entire climate change process. Climate change can be having more severe hurricanes. Right now it's predicted to be one of the strongest hurricane seasons we've had on record for a while. Uh, climate change could be more drought, which brings on more fires. So climate change is when we look at things long term instead of short term. Now, here in the United States, for some reason, climate change has become political. And we'd like to just say, let's not worry about that. Whether you think it's man-made or whether you think it's natural, really doesn't matter as much as the fact that we know that it is happening and that it's not only affecting us, but it's also affecting different animal species. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the animal species, some of them that it's affecting, and then we're gonna talk about some of the ways that we can make a difference. Um, because even if it is a natural occurrence, we all know we can th do things to change natural patterns. So let's start with some of the animals out there and how they're affected. Now, one of my favorites, and I think the one that grossed me out the most, it's from this guy right here. Now, some of you might recognize this. If you don't, I have a teeny tiny guy right here. This is a moose. So this is a moose's antler, and an antler is something that is grown and shed every year. So what's really fascinating about any animal that has an antler is this right here is called a button. The button grows on a specific part on your body scientists that had way too much on their hands to way too much time on their hands discovered that if they took the button part off the skull of say a deer or a moose and put it on their side an antler would grow there 
So that button is a pretty important part. But the moose will grow this antler. The males will grow it to attract girlfriends because the girls think they're, they're pretty handsome. So they'll grow that. And then after mating season, the antlers will be lost. Now, that happens right now, regardless of the climate out there. But there is something that is affecting the moose's ability to be healthy. This is going to gross you guys out. It's ticks and other parasites. So raise your hand if you've ever had a tick. They're gross. I have, I don't like them. What's happening in areas where moose live, moose don't live here in Kansas. They don't live in Nebraska, really not even in South Dakota. You have to go north, north, north. And what happens where they live in the north is it's somewhat warm during the summer, but in the winter time, it historically would get very, very cold. I have a bee enjoying me right now, guys. So um, they would get very, very cold. And when it got super cold, the ticks would die off. That would allow the moose then its body to regain any of the energy that it was losing from having these parasites sucking, literally sucking the life out of them. So with a small degree in temperature change, one of the things that we see happening is the parasites, those ticks and leeches and other animals like that are not dying off. They're staying on the moose's body and then the moose become weak. When they're weak, their bodies aren't as strong to produce those antlers. When they're weak then, they're not as strong, the males to try and dance around and attract those females. If the females aren't interested, less baby moose will be born and our moose populations will decline. Now, sadly for all of our kids out there too, the calves, which are the baby moose, the baby mooses, the baby moose, they are the most dramatically affected. So though they spend more time laying down in the grass, so they naturally will get more ticks. If the ticks don't die off in the winter because of the cold, um, we are even finding moose calves that cannot survive anymore because of the amount of ticks they have on their body. That is all directly related from, to climate change. So regardless of whether you want it to be warmer out or not, if you don't get ticks, then you need, we need to try and figure out ways to be able to keep our climate uh, the historic temperatures they were. Now let's look at another animal. I think this one's pretty neat. So you may not be able to see these pieces very well, but these are two pieces from a sea turtle. So you can, again, be buzzing me. You can see on my little sea turtle here, this is um, the shell from a, a hawksbill sea turtle, which is a very, very endangered animal. Now, that is a whole different ball game that we're focusing on, and that's poaching. We're not gonna talk about that today. What's fascinating to me about sea turtles is that the females lay eggs. They will go on to shore, They'll use their back flippers and they'll dig a hole. They'll lay their eggs in the hole and then the female leaves and never sees those eggs again. The babies, if they hatch, know everything that they need to do to survive. So after a certain amount of time, those babies will hatch. They'll crawl up and hopefully they'll crawl to the ocean and make it. Here's the cool thing. The temperature at which the eggs are laid is dependent on um, whether they become male or female. So if it is slightly warmer, what we see is that more females will be hatched. So if you need to have an equal amount of male and female sea turtles, if our temperatures change even slightly, you'll automatically have more females, less males, which could ultimately mean less eggs. Now here's the cool thing. I love motivated people. And some really motivated people realized that this was happening and they tried a couple things. One, they started putting big tents up over the areas where the sea turtle females would lay their eggs. Just having the sun shade those areas of the beach helped reduce the temperature of those eggs. The second thing that they did is started running cool water over the beaches. 
that cool water then reduced the temperature of the sand, also then reduced the temperature of the eggs. And where they have done that, what they have discovered is the eggs have more of a 50-50 mix. So really great things out there. And that's what always makes me excited, is how smart we as humans are to find a problem, to see a problem, and to figure out how to fix it. So luckily, there's a whole lot of sea turtle fans out there doing as hard a work as they can. Now, let's talk about another one. How about this guy right here? Now, this might be a little bit hard to see. Let's see, if I put it down here, it's probably easier. This is a penguin skull. Now, this skull happens to be from a Humboldt penguin. Now, before you guys get confused, you might see behind me, what am I standing near? I'm standing near the polar bears. Here is a, a secret that shouldn't be kept. Penguins and polar bears never, ever, ever live the same place. Polar bears are on the north, penguins are on the south. So if you ever see a place where there's penguins and polar bears together, it's just a cartoon. It really doesn't happen that way. But both of them are what we call pelagic species. What that means is that they spend most of their time out to water, out to sea, and they depend on the sea for their food. With penguins, it's eating small fish. So they love things like um, capelin and smelt and even anchovies, something that you might have eaten before. They love to eat these little fish. As the climate changes, a couple of things happen. Those fish populations don't live in the same place they used to. So again, I live here in Wichita and I'm on the west side of town. I know where my favorite restaurants are here on the west side of town, but if I all of a sudden was on the east side of town, I wouldn't know where to eat. Penguins are the same way. They have their territory, their area that they like to live in. If those fish populations change and they're no longer the same, they don't know where to find their food. Now, that in itself, okay, they might find enough food, but what about those penguins with eggs? Penguin parenting is super cool. What will happen is mom will sit on the nest and dad will go out and fish. Dad will come back, regurgitate, yes, throw up, the fish for the babies and then sit and take care of the babies while mom goes out to fish. She comes back, does the same thing, and then dad goes out. So right now, again, think of it like you guys. If you sent your parents out or the big people you live with out to get you a frosty, if the Wendy's was near your house and just two miles away, it might take them 10 minutes. But if that Wendy's closed and now they had to drive 20 miles across town, it might take them an hour. And whenever it takes longer and longer for those animals to get their food, those chicks, there's less and less chance of survival. So having that slight warming of our oceans changes the pattern of our fish, which changes the pattern of not only penguins and the South Pole, but it can also change the behaviors of the polar bears that will live in the North Pole. Now, they will eat fish but they're pretty big. So normally they have to eat animals that eat fish. And again, if those fish disappear, the animals that eat the fish will follow them and then the polar bears won't have the food that they need. Plus you see right behind me, okay, icebergs are kind of blue, just like this, only because the way the light reflects, ref, reflects, refracts off of them, another great science thing, but What's happening again is as just very slight changes in our climate occur, we're seeing there's less and less frozen ice land for them to be on. There's more ice floating, and that isn't as successful for the polar bears to hunt on. So again, climate change is affecting these animals. As a matter of fact, some people say that the polar bear is probably the poster child for climate change. Some scientists would even say that children today their children will not see polar bears in the wild because of the rate of climate change that we're happening that's happening right now so again like it or not man-made or natural it is happening and it is affecting the animals that we so love so polar bears and penguins definitely animals that are also being affected 
But what about animals that live where it's hot? Are they affected? Yes, they are. So if I look at this animal right here, everybody know what this one is? This is some of the most amazing skin ever. This is the skin from an elephant. Now, elephants are really large animals and they have this really thick skin because where they live, this is an African elephant, where they live in Africa, the sun can be really hot. So they have this thick skin to help protect them. Elephants are also the bulldozers of the animal world. An elephant hasn't ever met a tree that it can't try and take down. And in the wild, that's what elephants would eat. They would spend most of their time finding forested areas, knocking down those trees, and then eating almost every part of that tree. The branches, the leaves, the bark, even sometimes the inside, that phloem of the tree, they will eat as well. So they need to have this really thick skin in order to protect them from some of the thorns that you find, can find on trees. Now, elephants eat a lot. As a matter of fact, an elephant can eat a couple of hundred pounds of grasses and trees and leaves a day. But they also have to drink a lot too. So an elephant can drink on average about 300 gallons in one day. Now imagine that. Everybody think of that gallon of milk that you might have in your fridge at home. Now imagine drinking 300 of those a day. Now think about an elephant family. Elephants don't live by themselves. They live in groups. The moms take care of the group and tell them where to go. But because they live in groups, you might have 10 elephants all going to the same watering hole, all drinking 300 gallons of water a day. Guys, do the math. That's a lot of water. And as our climate is changing, what we see is that many of those watering holes are drying up. As they're drying up, the elephants will have to travel further and further or some of the elephants might not get as much water as they need, then they might not be as healthy either. So we're seeing lots of different things like that that are happening. Now, what about here in Kansas? Do we have things that are affecting us here in Kansas? We do. One of the things that we can look at even is our own reptile and amphibian species. There is a group, an organization called the Kansas Herpetological Society. One of the things that they like to do is go out and study reptiles and some amphibians, but reptiles for the most part. One of the things that they have noticed or some of their um, members have noticed is in Kansas now, we can find reptiles out and active every month of the year. So even in January, even in February, we sometimes find them out, find them out and about. That's not normal. And what happens with that then is it changes their breeding cycles. It changes when they can find food. And some of them use so much energy that when they do need to go dormant or take a little sleep again, they don't have enough energy to do it. Even right here at the zoo, about two years ago on Christmas Eve, we found a leopard frog um, right next to our building hopping around. So those types of things are happening. So even right here in Kansas, we're seeing some of the different things that are happening as our climate changes. The great news is, guys, though, there's things we can do about it. And that's what's wonderful. Some of them are really simple and probably things that you are doing right now, like recycling. Now you might say, well, Shanae, how does recycling help? Anytime we can take a resource that's already been made and break it down and remake it, it takes less energy. If it takes less energy, right now in the state of Kansas, that means it takes less fossil fuels, things like coal. Coal burning then contributes to greenhouse gases, which then contributes to our climate changing. So doing something as simple as recycling. If you watched our episode that we did at the commissary, we talked about how we recycle our bags and repurpose our food bags. So doing something simple like that. And guys, I've done it. I'm two years now without any plastic bags. So it can be done. It just sometimes means you have to carry a whole lot of things out of the grocery store at one time. Another thing that you can do is make sure you're bringing your own cup places. So here at the zoo, for example, we as employees or even you as guests, 
can go ahead and bring your cup back to the restaurant, to the water fountains, and fill those up so that you're not constantly having to get a new cup um, and a new straw and all those other devices. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say ditch the straws. Now, straws don't really have a whole lot to do with climate change, but they do have to do with how they affect animals, especially those aquatic animals. And when the polar bears and the penguins are already struggling with some of the climate change uh, situations, let's not make it any easier, any harder for them. Let's just go ahead and get rid of those straws. It's a great thing. Now, I know some of you are working on your electronics right now. That's great. We are in a technology world. As a matter of fact, you can see I have my microphone here. I've got a phone in my pocket. I've got a computer back in my office. But anything that has a light that flashes or a clock is constantly sucking energy. So we call those energy vampires. Devices that we have, your coffee pot, your computer, your toaster, all of those things, your TVs, even when they're turned off, they're still drawing energy to them. So you can make a big difference by doing the simplest thing in the world, and that's unplugging them. So my kids at home know that every day before we leave for school, one of the things we do is we unplug the coffee pot, we unplug the toaster, and we unplug our computers. That way we don't have those energy vampires out there. It's estimated that 40 to 60% of all the energy that's made is lost from energy vampires and from the, the wires that are above us. Now, fall is my favorite time of year. I love it, but the temperatures go up crazy and down crazy too. Another very, very simple thing you can do to help is just adjust your thermostat. Keep your house a little bit warmer in the summer and a little bit colder in the winter. If you're like me, nothing is better than a big, pit, a big a thick pair of wool socks. That will help you then um, be able to keep your house a little bit cooler and make a difference for the moose. And that's what we all want to do is help make that moose a little bit healthier. Now, speaking of health, we can be healthier by walking more and by biking more. As a matter of fact, for every two miles you ride a bike, instead of being a car, you actually help reduce, you, you give out two pounds less of CO2, which is that gas, which helps in with the greenhouse effect. So there's lots of very, very simple things that we can do every day. Reduce your carbon footprint um, by doing things like turning the thermostat down um, by things like unplugging the tools you're not using. You can walk more. Everybody should have the goal of 10,000 steps or more a day, so try that. Also remembering how to reduce your water consumption. Now folks, I'm not saying drink less water. I'm saying if you have a toilet that flushes on its own or a dripping sink, fix that. Anytime we can fix that, it makes a huge, huge difference out there. And again, what we want to do is make sure that we have a greener earth for these animals out there. There's always little things that you can do, like bring your own water bottle to your next soccer or track meet instead of getting a disposable bottle. And there are so many green jobs out there. Now, a green job doesn't mean that you wear green clothes. A green job means that it's a job out there where you are truly making a difference, where you are helping figure out how to protect moose and cut down those parasite populations, where you are working with ways to reduce the temperatures in areas so that uh, sea turtle males and females are born equally, where you're making sure that there's plenty of water out there. Heck, you never know. One of you out there watching might just could, might just be the next person working for NASA. Maybe you'll be manning a satellite, a satellite that helps us track our climate changes and helps us then find solutions to that. So remember guys, we can make a difference. There's the one piece I always saying, one person can't make a difference. I'm here to say you can. You can always make a difference by reducing, reusing, repurposing, 
turning off those electronics, looking around your house to see where you can be more efficient. And instead of taking 10 trips to the grocery store, write a list and just take one trip as well. Now, if you're out and about in the fall like I am, I know this weekend we're gonna decorate for Halloween. Also think about your yards. You can zero scape your yard, meaning you can plant native trees and native plants. Not only does it use less water, it's more adapted to our temperatures. And you remember that pesky bee that was around us? It also helps beautiful animals like those bees because one out of every three bites of food you eat is only here because of a pollinator like a bee. And as our climate changes, even those pollinators change. So guys, we can make a difference. Be the change, get out there and be the next generation of conservationists. And remember to reduce, reuse and repurpose and help keep those ticks off the moose. Let's see if there's any questions out there for us, Clint. Uh, yeah, they, there's a what happens if a tick gets on a small animal? Oh, that is a great question. If a tick gets off a, on a small animal, obviously a small animal has less blood than a moose. So if a small animal was infested with ticks, it could actually harm it much faster. So five or six ticks on a mouse is much more detrimental than five or six ticks on a moose. Well, great question. that is a great question. I think we are at that time of this okay. session where you can take a selfie with our good friend Shanae here. So if you would get your class, get your class up and we'll give you a second to get in place. Okay. And we have some helpers that have been helping us, Clint. Let's see if they want to jump in the photo let's as well. Let's get Bailey and Kristen Always in there. Always fun to have a few with us. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Climate change. Here's to promoting changing climate change. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you to Shanae and the Sedgwick County Zoo and Bailey. Thanks to our good friend Kristen here. And as always, thanks to our awesome boss behind the scenes, Mrs. Smoke. That's right. Any last words, Mrs. Smoke, before we sign off? I think we are good to go, my friends. Thank you again, Sinead. There's lots of information for us to use. So thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. See you guys on another adventure. Bye-bye.